Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. We are back once again to analyze the day's Hindu newspaper and to pick out the most important news stories from both the prelims and the mains examination point of view. These are the news articles that we'll be discussing today. From the editorial section, there's an article about the concept of social justice and how the countries, specifically India, moving towards free market economy, moving towards neoliberalism, have now ignored the idea of social justice. We'll be discussing what that is, the teachings of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, and the need to have social justice. Second article is <clears throat> about whether we would be living in a world that is free of plastic or not. What is it that the international community is doing about it? There was a recent conference held in Nairobi, <coughs> sorry, in the month of November, where the countries discussed banning plastics at a much larger scale. But there are a few countries that do not want that. We'll be discussing what that is. How are the countries, including India, trying to stop the spread of plastic in this current scenario? Third article is about the working of the GPS. This is a science-based article. Nothing about the GPS is in the recent news, but the Hindu has given a long explainer about the working of the GPS, how does it work, what about India's Navic system, how is it different from the GPS, which are the other countries that have their own navigation systems. Then for the prelims exam point of view, first we'll be discussing about how the nations are planning to phase out the use of fossil fuel in the COP that is held in the UAE. Then the WMA World Meteorological Organization has now said that glaciers have shrunk by one meter in a year means there is an urgent need to take action because the global glaciers that hold most of the clean and fresh water they are now shrinking at a very very fast pace means the average increase in the sea level globally will be very high then there's an article about a new tribe that has been given a scheduled tribe status that is the Hatis but they have not been given their certificates. We'll be discussing what that issue is. And in the end, India <coughs> has offered $250 million line of credit to Kenya. We'll be discussing what is the status of India-Kenya relationship, how is Kenya important to India, and what is it that you need to remember with respect to Kenya. Let's begin with the very first article. <coughs> the first article here talks about the idea that India specifically in the past few years, has moved towards the concept of neoliberalism. Because of which the idea of social justice has been left behind. Now, before you get too confused, let's simplify this for you. What do you mean by neoliberalism? These are the kind of words that you see very often used in politics. First, the word neo means new. Whenever you prefix the word new in front of any ideology, that means a new form of that ideology. So neoliberalism means a new form of liberalism. If you go back in history around the world, how did neoliberalism originate? Let's try and understand this very basic history. Most of the Western world adopted capitalism as their go-to method of running the economy. But when they saw that capitalism, that is giving free hand to the entire market does not work well. When we had the Great Depression in the US in 1929, the entire world stock market and the other exchanges were also seeing a lot of trouble. There was a need felt in the world after 1930s that we cannot give a completely free hand to the world economy. We have to, that is a government has to put in some controls. So from the 1930s started the era which is called the Keynes model or the Keynes model. In the Keynes model, the government started to regulate the working of the economy. This went on till 1970s. In 1970s, it was felt once again that maybe the world is going too much towards control. Maybe the world economy is now in the clutches of the government. We have to set it free. So once again in 1970s, the emergence of neoliberalism was seen. So 1930s, we went from liberalism to a controlled economy, a much regulated economy. Then in 1970s, fed up by all these regulations, the world again went back to neoliberalism. 
So neoliberalism in simple terms means that the government should not try to regulate the market. The government should not try to become a nanny. This became a very famous phrase, the nanny state. In 1960s, in the US, in the UK, there were movements where people said that the government is controlling the market so much that a country is becoming a nanny state. Means the government is just controlling the market in every single way possible. By 1970s, the government took a back seat and once again, much more free-spirited market came into existence. That was the emergence of neoliberalism. Now, what is the problem here? In simple term, neoliberalism means giving free hand to the market to earn as much profit as possible, to make whatever policies that they want, the government will not interfere. So what is the problem here? The problem here is that this does not go in line with the idea of social justice. The idea of social justice, as propagated by many people, including Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, was about ensuring that the fruits of development are distributed amongst the entire population. Social justice is an idea meant that the people who are from the deprived section of the society, they need government's help and the government must assist them in whatever way possible. The government must make sure that the government is helping them with their policies. The government must make sure that the government is helping them, be it in the form of reservation, be it in the form of subsidies, be it in the form of any other affirmative action. But the idea of neoliberalism is against that. If you have to put this into context, <clears throat> let's take the example of the recent decision of the High Court of Punjab and Haryana to strike down the reservation law in Haryana. Just a reminder, Haryana government had introduced a law that until or up till a specific salary ban, 30,000 per month, 75% of the private sector jobs will be reserved for people who are from Haryana only. The court said that no, this will not be allowed. So Haryana government can say that our idea of bringing this law was to ensure social justice. But the court said that no, you cannot interfere with the working of the private sector. So this divide between what is more important, liberalism is more important, giving more freedom to the businesses is more important, or is it more important that the government should fulfill its responsibility towards a deprived section of the society? It's a debate that still remains. Now, it's not just about the private sector. In fact, if you look at government reports, multiple government reports tell you that the representation of people from scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, even from the backward classes, the representation of these communities in the government services is very, very, very low. There have been multiple reports that if you look at people who work, let's say, as an IAS officer, above a certain rank, you will see very few people from the scheduled caste community or scheduled tribe community or from the other backward classes. So the representation of the deprived section of the society in even the most prestigious jobs is very, very, very low. I'll give you one more example. You all would have seen the cutoffs for examinations, let's say the UPSC, you would have seen the cutoffs for examinations such as CAT, IITs, JE, etc. Even though the cutoff for scheduled tribes is much lower than other categories, even then you will see a lot of seats of scheduled tribes just remain vacant because there are just not enough people writing that exam. That means that the representation of this section of the society is still lacking. Now, you might say that what is a problem? As long as a government, as long as a country is doing well, as long as a GDP is high, why should we care whether a certain section of the society is represented or not? But this is where we have to understand. The more diverse your society is, the more diverse your lawmakers are, the more diverse the people in the decision-making positions are, the better and the more diverse your country will be. If you have to make sure that a certain section of the society is uplifted, it is empowered, the easiest way to do that is to make sure that members of that community are empowered so that they can become examples for the others to do well. And in the idea of neoliberalism, that is not happening. Because for the corporates, for the businessmen, 
their top most priority is to expand their business and make as much profit as possible. Their idea is not to give representation to as many people as possible. Their idea is not to ensure that social justice prevails. Their idea is to earn as much profit as possible. To ensure representation is a responsibility of the government and not of the private sector. This is a new order that the author here is envisaging. The author says that our economic development should not come at the cost of at the cost of keeping this depressed section outside. The people belonging to the Dalit community, to the Adivasi groups, they should be a part of the market economy. We have to ensure that they get enough training. We have to ensure that they get enough skill sets in order to be eligible for high paying jobs, in order to be a worthy contributor to the world and the Indian GDP. This will only happen when there are pro Dalit and pro Adivasi policies made. This will only happen when the big businesses play a role in making sure that there are more entrepreneurs that are coming out from these groups. Now, you might say that the government has done a few things. The government, for example, has been encouraging as many people to become job givers or job creators as compared to job seekers. The government has tried to make it easier to get loans if you're an entrepreneur. But again, the numbers show that we still have a long, long way to go. It is the government that has a responsibility to ensure that social justice prevails. Now, if you look at our constitution, the idea of social justice is ingrained in our constitution. So many freedom fighters from Dr. B. R. Ambedkar to Mahatma Gandhi, all of them were strong proponents of the idea of social justice. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi very famously said that he does not believe in mass creation. He believes in creation by the masses. Means rather than employing machines to produce things in large numbers, we should employ many more people so that they can work by hand that will lead to their eventual economic development. Again, you might say that this goes against the basic of science. This goes against the idea of technological advancement and development. But any technological advancement as per the author cannot come at the cost of social justice. Now, again, the article does not give you any information with regards to current affairs as such. But the topic on which this article is written, the idea of social justice and how it should be a priority even in the era of neoliberalism is important to understand to first understand the idea of neoliberalism and then understand the idea of how social justice fits into this idea. I've explained this earlier, I'll repeat this once again. Beginning from the industrial revolution, most of the Western countries adopted a model of free market economy, laissez-faire, capitalism, whatever you want to call it. So the, most of the lib world's Western markets follow liberalism till at least 1929. That is when we saw the Great Depression, 29 to 33. And this is when the world thought that maybe there are some problems in this system. We cannot give a free hand to the companies. We have to regulate the way that they work. And this basically started the idea of Keynesian economics. Keynesian economics propagated the idea of having much larger role of the state, that the state must control the working. It ran till 1970s. In 1970s, we saw the emergence of leaders such as Margaret Thatcher in UK, Ronald Reagan in the US. They again implemented liberalism back because the slogan was roll back the frontiers of the state. Roll back the frontiers of the state. These things you would have read, especially if you have taken PSIR as an optional. The idea of liberalism, how it has emerged to neoliberalism. The idea was that the countries are turning into nanny state. And thus we need to do something. And thus we saw the emergence of neoliberalism. That is liberalism in a new form so that we can go back to the idea of a free market economy. Now over here, there is one other thing I wanted to share. Whenever you look at any world rankings in terms of social development, in terms of other indices, whenever you have to see which countries are more developed, you will usually see the Nordic countries coming right there at the top. 
Sweden, Norway, these kind of countries usually coming at the top. The interesting part is that these countries have a kind of a socialist model. In fact, it is called the ideal socialist model that these countries deploy. It's also called as a Nordic economic model. What exactly is a Nordic economic model that has been so successful that these countries continuously rank right there at the top? For example, it talks about having a welfare safety net for all. Most of these countries, for example, provide free education to all their citizens, free healthcare to all their citizens to make sure that at least the most basic necessities of humans are fulfilled by the state. It ensures corruption-free governance. It gives fundamental right to, as I said, tuition-free education, higher education also included. It also has shut down tax havens. Now understand, these countries are not someone who take low taxes. In India, you will see a lot of people crying over very high taxes. In these countries, the taxes are even higher. But the reason why people are not afraid or are not dissatisfied is that the people know that their money is going into good use. These countries charge a pretty high tax, especially on their rich people. They have large public sector enterprises. They have a universal welfare model. All this model has led to these countries continuously being not just the most developed countries in the world, but also continuously being rated as the happiest nations in the world as well. This is a model that many countries are trying to replicate around the world. Again, this is not based on liberalism. This is an idea based on socialism, but their idea of socialism is not the ones that we read in the books where the government controls everything and does not give any rights to the individuals. That was the first article. The second article from the Hindu newspaper today is based on the idea of harmful plastics that is now taking the world into a very, very dangerous time zone. The idea here is recently, last month in November, in Nairobi, Kenya, there was a meeting of Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, INC, which had its third meeting. So we'll refer to this as INC3. So what exactly is this committee? This committee works under the UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme. This committee was formed recently. The idea, the mandate that is given to this committee is bring the world nations together into a legally binding treaty where every country has now agreed or agrees to ban plastics. Because apart from the greenhouse gases, the one other big challenge that the entire world is facing is the widespread use of plastics. The years and years and years, even in some cases, decades and centuries that they take to degrade. And that is why the entire world is now coming together to manage this threat of plastic pollution. The third meeting of this committee was held in Nairobi. Their responsibility is to have a global plastic treaty by 2025. The good part is that the world is at least working towards this. The bad part is that there has not been any success in that regard. Even after a third meeting, there are not a lot of takeaways that you see from here. This committee recently negotiated zero draft text. Zero draft text means kind of the first draft where every country should agree. Every country should say that, okay, I agree to this. Now, what does this draft say? Now, this draft obviously says that Plastic pollution is very, very bad. We have to end it. It proposes that we should put financial penalties on those nations that are using it. It talks about complete ban of plastic in the coming years. However, as with any other treaty, this treaty also has been facing a lot of hurdles. For example, some nations are against this idea of banning plastic. Now, what are these nations? This is, this is very interesting. Nations such as Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, Iran and some other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council don't agree to this. Now try and see the connection. Why is it that these countries specifically would be against banning of plastics? Understand this. First, let's say the case of China. China is the world's factory. Most of the small tidbits, the little things that you see, your toys, etc. Any small component that you see, a lot of it made by plastic is manufactured in China. 
So banning of plastics, first for China specifically, it would harm their manufacturing industry. But what about the other nations? Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia, Gulf Cooperation Council, why are they worried about it? They are not the manufacturing hub. Because how is plastic created? Plastic is created by the byproducts that are found in crude oil. These countries have humongous reserves of crude oil, natural gas. When you refine these things, the byproducts that are found, those byproducts are used to then convert into plastic. So that is why these countries do not want the complete ban on plastic. This is where the negotiations are still stuck right now. The treaty also talks about reduction in the production of primary polymers. Again, many industry experts are also not happy with it. Because apart from these countries, governments, many industrial leaders also don't want to ban on plastic. Because for them, it will be very harmful for their business. It will be harmful for their economic development. So there have been many industries lobbying against the ban on plastics as well. Also, some nations want a null option here to be included in the treaty under which they would be or they should be allowed to come out of the treaty as well. There are some countries who do not want all the provisions of the treaty to be binding. Now, does the treaty have any financial penalties included in this? Not really. Some countries are trying to ensure that there are financial penalties on those who are not following the treaty. But again, the like-minded countries such as China and West Asian countries have not accepted this. Is there any limit on the plastic trade? Right now, no. There is no limit as such on the plastic trade. But yes, we do have a convention called the Basel Convention. I'm sure all of you would have read that. It talks about restriction of international trade of harmful substances. There, harmful plastic substances can be banned in certain categories, but it does not ban outright sale, import and export of the plastics. So this treaty has been trying to curb that as well. So that harmful plastics, something that cannot be decomposed, those plastics should not be sold to other countries. But again, the countries that produce plastic, the countries that manufacture plastic products such as China, would not want any of these controls on the trade. What is the other problem? The other issue is, how will this treaty be adopted? How will anything be decided in this treaty? Now understand, most of the world bodies, be it, let's say, uh, the WTO, usually they decide matters on consensus basis. Consensus basis means if there is a group that has 50 members, all 50 have to say yes for the decision to be accepted. Even if one says no, that means there is no consensus. That means in that case, we will not have the treaty passed. Countries such as India want such consensus basis decision making. We want that every country should say yes, only then the treaty should be accepted. Other countries want that no we should have a two-third majority vote. That if a two-third majority accepts a certain decision, it should be accepted. India does not want that because India uses this consensus-based approach to ensure that our interests are met at the global stage. Right now, today as we stand, there are no important takeaways from this treaty as such so far. Even after a third meeting, there are still a lot of pointers still under discussion about whether there should be financial penalties, what should be the way in which majority should be accepted, why will the countries accept this treaty if their economy is dependent on plastic manufacturing or manufacturing plastic products. All these are questions that still remain to be answered. Now, this Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, INC, that has been responsible to finalize this treaty. This is a very recent committee. It came into being just last year, Feb 2022. It works under the UN Environment Program. Again, it's an ad hoc committee kind of a thing. It has been created just to have this treaty where the entire world tries to come up with an idea to get rid of plastic. Once such a treaty is signed, once the treaty is finalized, this committee will go away. The first meeting was held in Uruguay in 2022. The idea of this committee is to get rid of plastics as soon as possible. 
basically they want that by 2040 at least we should get rid of the plastics they want to have a legally binding treaty for that for which most countries do not agree now what is india doing about this problem of plastics we have realized this in fact the single use plastic ban has been imposed by the government of india india has something called the plastic waste management rules that have been amended multiple times the last time these rules were amended were in 2022 under these rules that were amended in 2022 what is the government doing the government is trying to do a couple of things first basically they are trying to ban single use plastics that are very very thin understand the thinner the plastic the more difficult it is to decompose second thing that the government is doing is in this case the government is trying to ensure that the responsibility of recycling the plastic should be on the producer understand the government is trying to put the responsibility on the producer that you should be the one responsible for recycling this for example when you buy an led bulb let's say your led bulb has gone bad it has run out of life the question is what do you do with that led bulb now do you just throw it outside no you can't do that do you throw it with the food waste no you can't do that so how do you dispose that led bulb officially let's say you have bought the bulb that's of the company let's say philips philips will be responsible to now decompose and make sure that they recycle this bulb so you would have to deposit it with the philips representative they will take care of it so it is again responsibility of the producer to recycle all this waste the government has been trying to ensure that the rules make it stricter for these producers of these products to decompose all the product that they are selling the 2022 amendment had these features carry bags made up of virgin or recycled plastic should not be less than 75 microns till 31st december 2022 and after that it was 120 microns it also talked about plastic bags should should be made of recycled plastics only which are used for packaging food stuff and they should follow fssai standards sachets for plastic material should not be used for storing packing gutka pan masala etc all these are important features of india's plastic waste management rules of 2022 this is important for the examination point of view because the world now is trying to focus on getting rid of plastic in as much as much of a hurry as possible so it's important for you also to remember what are the steps and initiatives that the government of india is taking domestically internally to get rid of this problem the third article that we have here is again not something that is related to something that is in the news it's a generic article on science it talks about the working of the gps the global positioning system i am sure everyone here watching this would have used google maps some time or the other technology such as google map the app how do they work how they work is that they are able to get all that data from the gps that's a set of satellites that have been sent to the space by the us government using which they are able to map the entire earth gps was the first global positioning system it was started by the us government specifically for their military so that they can keep an eye on everyone after that many other countries also started to adopt this idea they started as a project in 1973 when it was first ideated and the first satellite was sent in 1978 today as we talk about the gps it covers probably the entire world for example if you have you are living in india you have your phone right now with you you travel to any part of the world you travel to australia you travel to europe you travel to africa the same phone with the same google map application will work properly why because again they are aligned with the gps that gives you the entire global coverage it has 24 satellites right now in total it has three main components that is a gps system the space segment the control segment and the user segment so basically the space segment has 24 satellites this is usually used by the us department of defense their military to keep an eye on everyone see in simple terms the gps has two versions there is a military grade version there is a civilian use version the one that we use on google map etc or or apple maps that is a civilian version free and open for everyone 
that is not as accurate as you would like. There are times that, for example, you have booked a cab, the cab driver is standing somewhere else and he's asking you, where are you? And you are asking him, where are you? Because that's not that accurate. The military version on the other hand is pinpoint accurate, but that is only used by the US military. They obviously do not open that up to the other civilians as such. So space segment covers 24 satellites in such a way that from any point on the earth, at any point you will see at least four of these satellites from any time. Then there is a control segment. Control segment is where these GPS facilities are open up to the manufacturers, to the companies that are working with different apps. For example, the GPS, or the Google map app is developed by Google. They would be paying a certain amount of fee for using the GPS. Would be paying a certain amount of fee, let's say, to the American government for using this. So application developers, etc., all of them coordinate with the GPS with the help of this control segment. And then we have the master control station that is again run by the US to control the working of the satellite. They have two master control stations, one in Colorado and there's a backup station as well that is in California to make sure everything is working fine with the GPS. Now, again, it has a lot of applications and I don't need to repeat that with you. We usually use that to go to places which are unexplored to find out ways, but it can be used for a lot of other applications as well. You might have used an application called Google Earth also. Sitting here, you can just zoom into any part of the world, see some photos of distinct parts of the world using GPS. It is also used for defense. For example, when there was intrusion by the Chinese into India, whenever they have crossed the border, many of the times it is actually America that tells us through its satellites, usually NASA, they tell us through their satellites that see there is intrusion in your country, someone is crossing over the border. So satellites, GPS, etc., they actually allow us to keep an eye on a large amount of areas. That is why many countries are now trying to have their own version of the GPS and to have their own version of the navigation system. However, all of these GPS, they may be used by different names. They have different area coverage, but the way in which they work is almost the same. All the GPS satellite broadcast radio signal that contains information about its location. These signals are then caught by your mobile phones. These signals are caught by other applications. Depending on how much time it is taking for them to catch the signal, they try and identify the location of that particular object. These radio waves, they travel at the speed of light and your smartphone receives them and tries to calculate the precise distance from the satellite. Now, because these calculations are or have very large numbers, that means even if the satellite is off by very, very, very much fraction of a second, even that can cause a miscalculation. Even if the satellite is one millisecond off, it can lead to an error of 300 kilometers. That is why it's extremely important that all these satellites use clocks that are extremely, extremely accurate. That is why they use something called the atomic clocks. <clears throat> In fact, I'll just discuss about India's own version of GPS at this Navic. In Navic, there, is, there are seven satellites, but one of the satellites actually had to be replaced because its atomic clock was not working properly. That is why the eighth satellite also had to be sent because again, the most important component is the atomic clock that ensures that the time maintained by that satellite is up to date. There are other countries that run such systems, Australia, China, European Union, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia, all of that have their own versions of the system. Let's talk about India. Now, the main difference between India, our version of this system, navigation system, NAVIC, and the GPS is, GPS is a global system. So it gives coverage throughout the earth. As I said, wherever you are, you can use the same app. In India, it's not a global system. In India, we have focused on India and 1500 kilometers from India. So ours is a regional system. It's a regional system. See the word regional here. Ours is not a global system, while GPS is a global system, so they will give you the data from the entire world. 
our navic system consists of <clears throat> a total of seven satellites again as i said total satellites sent were eight because one of them stopped working properly its atomic clock was not up to the mark and it had to be replaced so there are total seven satellites they are controlled by master control station that are in karnataka and bhopal in madhya pradesh apart from that we also use something called the gagan system which is gps aided geo augmented navigation to help our airplanes our pilots etc to have a better visibility whenever they are flying at difficult places this is what our india's navic or irnss system looks like indian regional navigation satellite system again seven satellites in total out of which four are geosynchronous and three are geostationary that reminds me i have a question for you do tell me in the comment section if government of india has to keep an eye on our border with pakistan listen to the question very carefully let's say the government of india has to send a satellite the role the role of that satellite will be to keep an eye on our border that we share with pakistan we want to know if someone is coming crossing over the border illegally or not for that purpose which satellite will we send will it be a geostationary satellite or will it be a geosynchronous satellite i hope you all understood the question the question is if the government of india has to keep an eye on our border we have to keep an eye if someone is crossing over the border illegally from pakistan side we want to send a satellite to keep an eye on that area which satellite will be sent geostation you should know and why what is the difference between the two why are we sending that one and not the other one do let me know in the comment section i read all your comments whoever does know the answer do tell me in the comment section one more interesting update about this the government of india warns that navic that is our system should actually be used by smartphones as well just like the google maps use the gps system we want that other phones now should change their hardware so that they are complementary to our navic system and guess what apple 15 has agreed to this apple now 15 version supports navic it's not it only supports navic it works with gps as well it makes gps even more accurate in india with the help of navic because navic focuses only on india so it is much more accurate within india as compared to gps so what apple 15 is doing uh, iphone 15 is doing they are now compatible with navic they do use the data from navic to make the gps even more accurate within the country these were the articles from the mains examination point of view now from the prelims exam point of view again a few news stories related to environment every single day you see news coming out of the cop 28 from the uae different negotiations taking place this news is about how the nations around the world are trying to phase out fossil fuel now this news came in earlier as well the world warns that the use of fossil fuel should end in the coming years now obviously countries such as india china do not like this see we talk a lot about how india has expanded its energy generation from renewable energy we have been using solar much more as compared to the last decade or so but the reality is even today if you look at india's power generation still a majority of india's power generation is dependent on fossil fuel only and that is why india is not in favor of taking out fossil fuel completely from the picture india china that is why has not agreed to this pledge now fossil fuel everyone agrees it is dangerous it is harmful for the world environment going forward it ranks only after methane in the heat trapping potential but economies which are still at the developing phase india china and even the us do not want to end the use of fossil fuel completely even today around the world fossil fuel accounts for 80% of the entire emissions what has happened is there is a gst that is global stock take again gst does not refer to the tax system that we have here gst refers to something called global stock take so basically what happened was in 2015 we had the paris climate change summit in 2015 countries made a lot of promises that we will do this we will do that to control increase in the global temperature now 
meetings are held to take stock of what the countries have done. Means meetings are held to now analyze if the steps taken by the countries are enough or not. In that aspect, the global stock take means initiative to keep an eye on what steps are the countries taking. They have analyzed that if the world really wants to stop global temperature from going beyond 2 degrees Celsius, we have to put an end to fossil fuel as much as possible. This commitment also says that we need to triple renewable energy capacity globally by 2030 as compared to 2022 level and take it to 11,000 gigawatts. We also have to improve our global average annual rate of energy efficiency as well. As I said, global stock take is in simple terms, analyzing and studying the steps that the nations have taken after the promises that they made at the Paris Climate Change Summit in 2015. It talks about the individual countries' efforts, the efforts that they have taken, are they on the right path or not. Amongst all the nations in the world, India is one of the few countries that is still on track <coughs> to fulfill our nationally determined contribution that we made in 2015. Most of the countries, including developed countries, are not on track. One more thing, as I was saying earlier, despite all this appreciation and news that you see, that India is continuously expanding its solar energy generation, the reality is in front of you. Even if you see today, how much electricity do we produce from fossil fuel as compared to renewable energy, it's only in 2030 that we expect that our renewable energy production will be 50% of our total electricity production. In 2020, only 23% of our electricity came from renewable. Now, this is a good number, by the way. It's not disappointing. This is a good number compared to some of the other countries. If you take into consideration India's size, India's economy, India's population, but we still have a long, long way to go. And right now, where we stand, we cannot afford to just phase out fossil fuel immediately. Also, you see, India's fossil fuel consumption has been increasing. It's not that we have decreased it. Year on year, India's fossil fuel production or consumption, sorry, has only been increasing. So on one hand, yes, we are focusing a lot on solar, wind, nuclear energy. But again, most of our energy that we consume still comes from fossil fuel only. Next article, again, related to what we just discussed. Again, a sad news from the environment section. The WMO, that is the World Meteorological Organization, has said that the glaciers shrank by one meter in a decade. Means the global climate change is real. If you needed any more evidence, we now have it from the WMO. Now, on one hand, the situation is getting worse. The glaciers are melting. The problem with the glaciers melting is that the average sea level will increase. So countries, cities that are very low lying, such as Bangladesh, for example, island nations such as Maldives, Mauritius, they are at a very big danger of the countries and the entire cities being submerged underwater. On the other hand, WMO still says that the good thing about what is happening at present is at least lesser lives have been lost due to these natural disasters because many countries have developed their own early warning system. People are now warned about the forecast, about cyclones, etc. You can take an example in case of India as well. Look at the example of Odisha. There was a time a few years ago when hundreds of people used to die whenever any cyclone used to enter Odisha. And now hardly anyone dies because we know very much in advance when a cyclone is about to hit and we can evacuate the people. Also, the WMO report says that public and private climate finance have doubled during this period of 2001 to 2010, but it needs to increase at least seven times by the end of this decade if we want to achieve a climate change target. So again, the biggest problem in our fight against climate change is the lack of finances because the developed world is not ready to pay up for the harm that they have done to the environment. A bit of information about WMO, whose report we have been discussing. It's an agency working under the UN. It talks about the Earth's atmosphere. It talks about any climate change issues that we are facing. It again is taken as a primary authority around the world whose reports are taken into consideration 
to take any action and to discuss these issues at the global level. How is it governed? It has a 36 member executive council which has an annual meeting. Again, whatever they say, it's not binding. It's just a kind of a suggestion for the world to make policies accordingly. It's secretary headed by secretary general who has a four year term. Some of their programs include the World Weather Watch, World Climate Program and Atmospheric Research and Environment Program. They work on a lot of things including global warming, ozone layer depletion, telecommunication ne networks that connect sea, etc. All of that comes within their mandate. Next article is a protest movement started by the Hathi community from Himachal Pradesh. So the Hathi community in Himachal Pradesh recently was given the scheduled tribe status. The problem is that they are saying that they have still not been given the certificates for it. Now, basically there is an issue going on here. Hathis are not one single tribe. So there are a bunch of tribes together. They are called the Hathis. The problem here is some of those tribes were already in the scheduled caste category. So now the problem is how is the government planning to shift them from scheduled caste to scheduled tribe status because this is not very common because many of them again for example Koli, Badhai, Lohar, Dhaki, Dom, Chamar all of these were earlier already recognized as scheduled caste. All of these come under the Hathi community. So how will they be transferred to scheduled tribe? That again is one of the reasons why this implementation has been delayed. In fact, this is one of the reasons why their earlier demand to be included in scheduled tribe status was declined by the office of the Registrar General of India. They have now been demanding that we want our certificates to be issued as soon as possible because the government had given them a go ahead and officially they are under the scheduled tribes list now. Now the question is, how does it happen? How is it that a certain community gets to be in the scheduled tribe list? This is how the process works. Starts at the state government level. Their recommendation is given to the tribal affair ministry. They review the recommendation. They send it to the Registrar General of India for the approval. Then National Commission for Scheduled Tribe also has to approve. After that, it is a cabinet at the center government level that decides they prepare a bill and the bill has to be passed in both houses of the parliament. After which it is a president of India that has to give assent to the bill. So once the bill is given the assent, the scheduled tribe list is changed, it is altered and the inclusion happens. Now, please remember inclusion in scheduled tribe is an important topic because this is what started all this problem in Manipur as well. If you remember the entire issue in Manipur about the Metis and the Kuhi community, it also started with this demand where the Metis were demanding they should also be included in the scheduled tribe list. So do remember this as well. The last news for the day is the government of India trying to strengthen its relationship with Africa and most specifically with Kenya. The government has provided $250 million line of credit to Kenya. Now, Kenya is one of those countries in Africa with which we do have a close relationship. There are a lot of people of Indian origin living in Kenya. But then Indian origin people can be found anywhere in the world and not just Kenya. The government of India has been carrying out joint military exercises also with Kenya. We have been helping them by exporting our agriculture expertise as well. First Indian in fact went to Kenya in 1911. And since then there has been a search a gradual increase in the Indian population in Kenya. I also would urge you to read about something called the ITEC, Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation. This is a program that the government of India runs since 1960s. Under which the government of India helps other developing and least developed countries with scholarships, line of credits, etc., helping them with expertise. We help a lot of nations in Africa. We help a lot of nations in Asia as well under this program. Do remember the neighboring countries of Kenya because again this is relevant for us now. Tanzania, Uganda, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, all of these share a border with Kenya. It also has a, a coastline that means the Indian Ocean and it also has a border with Lake Victoria as well. 
This brings us to the end of today's Hindu newspaper analysis. Here are a couple of practice questions for you. Once again, reminding you a couple of things. First, as soon as this session comes to an end, we have a quiz on our Telegram channel where we have questions based on the topics that we have discussed. So please move over there. Give the quiz, see how many of these topics you remember. If you have still not become a part of our Telegram channel, the link for that is given in the description of the video. In the description, we'll also find the link to our student answer writing portal where you can go and submit these answers. You can see answers of other students as well. Give each other feedback to learn from each other's mistakes. Thank you so much for watching in. I'll now be back tomorrow, 10 a.m. with the next session of the Hindu News of Analysis. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.